Riyong Namaha. In the early 80s, just before the second transformation went down in the fabricated so called ISKCON Confederation, a popular game was invented. It today serves as an analogy to our theme. This game centered around many four sided wooden sticks which we shall henceforth call blocks. Those blocks create what is, in the beginning, a solid Jenga tower. Each participant in the game has to remove a block from below and place it on the top level until the structure eventually collapses due to lack of solid underpinning. When one block is pulled which collapses the tower, that contestant loses the game. There was a box office hit in 2015 called The Big Short, and one scene in it featured a Jenga, Jenga tower. This scene illustrated how some banks and investment houses were on the verge of collapse due to propping up a faulty derivative scheme in 2007 and 2008. With but a few valuable bundles or blocks of mortgages, each derivative had hidden within it many worthless and shaky subprime mortgages bundled together. The Jenga Tower in the movie represented mostly low-grade mortgage bonds actually becoming or already worthless at its bottom and middle. Each block consisted of many mortgages bundled together, most of them shaky or worthless, while the few actually valuable bundled mortgages were all AAA bonds and were placed at the top. They appeared to make the financial instrument valuable, but it was not. These mortgages had all been bundled together as a collateralized debt obligation, a complex derivative. Hedge fund managers at investment houses and banks had previously made, and were still making at that time, many millions of dollars by leveraging, promoting, and marketing such financial entities until the housing bubble of thousands of these concocted derivatives went busto in 2008. However, just before that went down, and it caused a serious recession, as you may remember, in America, a handful of investors, knowing how those schemes worked and how their market would soon crater, took out what were called credit default swaps from some major banks. These swaps were also derivatives, but they were newly created in order to offset the credit risk intrinsic to the other popular but risky derivatives. In essence, these default swaps were a form of shorting the derivative mortgage market. Applying this analogy to the presentation here, today we expose false facts and mistaken knowledge. They are represented by individual Jenga blocks of a different construct. These so-called facts are self-serving and flawed presuppositions still held and propagated by the ISKCON old guard. ISKCON with quotation marks on each side of the acronym. They are the principles of that cult's rickety Jenga tower. The old guard formerly controlled the cult or cooperated with all of its deviations. Those deviations led to its current shaky status and its tower could crater at any time. In point of fact, there was at least one occasion in the mid-80s in which it almost did. The old guard of 
so-called ISKCON, is still influential in propping up today's version of that organized Eastern religion. They have helped to erect a flawed structure of what still appears to be a bona fide bhakti superstructure. The blocks of its pseudo-spiritual tower have varying degrees of importance within it preventing the collapse. As per this analogy that we're using here, exposing each of the blocks, each of those false facts or rationalizations for what they really are, is akin to removing them from your mind one by one and thus from the allegorical foundation of so-called ISKCON. One of the air quotes ISKCON blocks is of particularly, in, in particular importance. Near the conclusion of our presentation, we shall spend more time exposing it. If critical mass is achieved in exposing this particular myth, the Iskan Jenga Tower will topple, bringing joy to all the devotees who have been harassed by the cult's rationalizations for decades. That particular block just referenced is of essential value to the old guard. Indeed, their reputations are more or less dependent upon it. They pushed it just after Prabhupada left the scene. Their basis for doing so is ever increasingly obvious now. We propose realization of how obvious it is that such realization will increase as each devotee assimilates the message delivered here. The Iskan Jenga Tower is a narrative it is the narrative of the cult's old guard and is for all practical purposes accepted by everyone in their institution. It is not disputed within it because if it was contentious, there would immediately be a major schism that would jeopardize their whole make show. There already is a kind of subterranean split in the cult between the liberal faction and the quasi-conservative faction. This split took many years to form because the organization's illusion of unity was considered essential by both camps and it's still considered essential. However, with the institutional approval of female Diksha gurus less than a decade ago, the schism, previously hidden, exacerbated it metastasized a little bit. Nevertheless, it is kept in-house still and hidden from the public, especially the Hindu public, which still subsidizes, subsidizes the organization to some degree, because any noticeable internecine war could and would prove fatal to that revenue flow. The Iskan Old Guard narrative buttressed the vitiated GBC back in the day during the heady late 70s and early 80s when the zonal imposition was implemented. Indeed, to a significant extent, the old guard were members of that GBC. Some of them benefited from the first transformation, but not all of them, but not all of them did. Some benefited from the second transformation, which replaced it, but again, not all of them did. However, they were all dependent upon what may be called the ISKCON narrative, ISKCON in quotation marks. And that is what constitutes the analogous ISKCON Jenga Tower as per this month's presentation. They remain dependent upon it for their reputations which some consider to be exalted. We do not at all share that view, of course. On the contrary, 
we hold the old guard responsible for all the major deviation that went down before and since the first major deviation of March 1978. It could not have gone down without their help. And if there were not many misconceptions they upheld and pushed about what Prabhupada had actually authorized. The various blocks underpinning the Iskan Jenga Tower constitute those misconceptions, rationalizations, and flawed presuppositions. They deserve to be pulled out from underneath the tower, seen for what they are, and then thrown into the trash can. In the process, the reputations of the old guard also deserve to be trashed since their statuses are not more important than Lord Chaitanya's golden age. Indeed, their reputations deserve to be tainted in order to remove their influence from the, air quotes, ISKCON superstructure, a dome which is compressing the reemergence of Lord Chaitanya's movement. There is little need to get into either Neomut or Ritvik here, because they, in different ways, with different flawed perspectives, already do not honor many of the blocks constituting the Iskan Jenga Tower. They do, however, recognize a few of those misconceptions, the ones that still benefit them. It is the Iskan Old Guard, which is the chief problem holding those blocks of its Jenga Tower in place. Their shared narrative differs from those pushed by Neomut and Ritvik. However, it would compound the difficulty to elucidate it if we chose to get into a comparative study of these cults. As such, we choose to instead target the air quotes ISKCON narrative only. Let us now consider who are the members of the old guard of so-called ISKCON and who are not. First of all, its active members must be alive. The dead have no title and no membership. Some of the old guard has died off, as could only have been expected, although most of them are still living. As such, those men continue to exert their influence. Neither the third echelon nor the newcomers are or can be members of the old guard. Eligibility was cut off even before his divine grace left the scene. They are all current or former members of the higher two echelons of the cult. All of the great pretenders were GBC members, but two betrayed the narrative and lost their statuses in the process. Hung Sududa was one of these. Four great pretenders, including Hung Sududa, are dead, and one other is in quite bad shape although his membership is still viable. Only one member of the old guard is still on the GBC, as it has had almost a complete turnover since the late 70s. One of the protocols of the old guard is not to advertise the blocks of their Jenga tower openly. These misconceptions and rationalizations are highly contagious on the astral plane, and as such, these men prefer to vibe them. Still, every now and then, they will verbalize one, particularly the chief block. If that one is removed, their tower collapses. Now, Hunksaduta sometimes defied this tactic. In other words, sometimes he was blatant. For example, he openly preached that if you were under the command of a devotee in the movement here on earth, that subordination would continue in the spiritual world. Those who bought into this, with whomsoever they did so, were little more than silly putty in the hands of that particular member of the old guard. If your Sarup was to be a follower of some particular devotee in the external world and the internal world, and a special arrangement had been made for you to be his disciple in this external world, 
then you foolishly considered yourself privileged and fell in line every time, all of the time. This was one of the blocks of the cult's Jenga tower, but it was not and is not an essential one. It could be removed without the structure collapsing, but Hunks Duda made it known, and this was not approved. This tendency of his, along with a firearms fetish, criminal activity, gambling, drunkenness, and sexual connections with his god brothers and female disciples, got him de facto excommunicated by the governing body in May of 1983. Now, it had come down heavy on him three years earlier along with TKG, but the Machiavellian manipulator had kept a trump card at the bottom of his deck that he could play. He made it clear that he was about to do so, and both he and Hunksaduda were accepted back. TKG lasted until he was violently taken out in 2002. Hunksaduda soon became a Ritvik leader, and therefore, and thereafter, permanently lost his status in so-called ISKCON. Each member of the old guard was an expert cult manipulator. They were well trained in this, but not by Prabhupada. He wanted all of his real workers to become self-realized and then God-realized, but the great cult manipulators made sure that did not come to pass. They knew how to hit the psychic buttons at the right time in the perfect way. They knew when to throw the psychic toggle switches, and they made sure that they stayed on top of the turtle tank by doing so. They manipulated their god brothers effectively, turning some of them into sycophants who carried out their orders and became just like them, but at a lower level of power, of course. Many, many of their god brothers were easily manipulated because devotees scored high in being ultra compulsive. This was drilled into them on a daily basis, since following orders was inculcated by Prabhupada. There was no fault in that. But when the process got subverted into following egotistical orders given by the cult manipulators for their own aggrandizement, then the system became both rigged and deviated. Consider this excerpt from September 9th, 1972, in a letter to one of the original GBCs. Quote, Regarding your questions... You say that amongst the elder disciples, there are still symptoms of greed, anger, strife, bickering, etc., but you are one of them. You are one of the old students, so you fall in that group. So the fighting is among that group, but not amongst the real workers, unquote. This letter's recipient, as we have just stated, was one of the first tranche appointed in 1970, but he was the best of the lot. Seeing how things were going, he resigned from the governing body, and he should be praised for doing so. Nevertheless, this reply establishes that the first and indirectly the second echelon men were not the real workers. That is how they got their in-house training, but this was never what Prabhupada wanted for his movement. The old guard were GBC men, sannyasis, and temple presidents, almost without exception. At the current time, there may only be one old guard man who is still a temple president. All of them are institutionalists. The party men buy into the old guard narrative and its myths, and they are also suspicious of those who do not. As far as the elder sannyasis are concerned, those who were and remain part of the old guard are also repressive in this way. Sure, they can be all smiles, turn on the charm, and love bomb with the best. However, carrying that rod of chastisement, they know how to manipulate and intimidate with it via projecting constant suspicion the pressure of suspicion 
was always there in the movement. It was, to some limited extent, justified, because devotees, if and or when they lost spiritual dedication, their past identification would manifest. Virtually no one came to the movement from the mode of goodness. However, as the years went on, all of this got converted. Suspicion became an ever more potent means of creating an atmosphere of constant intimidation. You had to bend over backwards to convince the old guard and its loyalists that you believed in the old guard, believed their myths, believed their narrative, and held them in high esteem. Especially after Prabhupada left, they deserved no such adulation, however. As far as the newcomers are concerned, some of them are being trained to carry on in the eventual absence of the old guard. Most are not, however, nor can they ever reach the same level of power and manipulation despite whatever training they may or may not receive. Separately from them, although they enforce it, the hatchet men can and will never be part of this overlord sector because they do not have the psychological skills to meet the criteria. In summary, as far as the newcomers are concerned, those who came after the gold rush, they were and are low-hanging fruit. Not all of the old guard is active in so-called ISKCON. Some live outside of it, and to a rather insignificant extent and at the margins only, criticize how it has been run and continues to be run. What they all have in common, however, is propping up the ISKCON Tower of Power by pushing the same flawed narrative. It particularly depends upon one of those blocks. We shall get to that one near the end of the presentation and all of the old guard has an essential vested interest in maintaining it. Tatwamasi. The first myth discussed can be summarized as follows. Prabhupada chastises leaders sometimes, this is the myth now, but he was mostly very much pleased with them and pleased with his governing body commission. He was confident that the movement was in good hands and in no jeopardy of failure or degradation. Now our commentary on this myth. There were a few excerpts from the letters which provide evidence of this self-serving presupposition. But let us consider some factors which belie it. First, why did Prabhupada even mention that his movement could be ruined. If it was actually in good hands, there would be no need to bring up such a negative provisional development. However, he often did mention that it could be ruined. Here's an excerpt from a letter to one of his leaders in the African Yatra dated November 1st, 1974. <coughs> Quote, I pray to Krishna that you all may use your intelligence for Krishna's service and not for any personal ambition. We have worked very hard and established a great institution. But if we think for our personal benefit, then it will become ruined. That is my only concern." Unquote. The poison is personal ambition. In hindsight, we know now, beyond any doubt, that many, if not most, of his leaders were loaded with egotistical personal ambition. The Zonal Acharya debacle ruined the movement, and all 11 of those men were chock full of personal ambition. This is indisputable. More evidence of the bad management that pervaded his movement in the mid-70s. Here it is in this excerpt dated... June 4th, 1975. Quote, One thing is, though, 
If the management continues to be so nasty, then that place will also be ruined. Management must be done very nicely, otherwise it is useless." Unquote. Notice, he writes, quote unquote, also be ruined. It was not a one-off. In other words, other centers were similarly being ruined. Let us proceed to a warning about ulterior motives given very early in his movement to one of his first disciples dated July 1st, 1969, quote, If you adulterate our Sankirtan movement with some business motive, then it will be spoiled immediately. Be careful in that way, unquote. Business motive is one thing, but self-aggrandizement qualifies for the same result as evidenced by what went down later. Here's another warning from those early days to one of his first disciples, dated September 1st, 1969, quote, But one thing is, you must stop this fighting between brothers. Otherwise, the whole program will be spoiled. Yourself, Tamal Krishna, Brahmananda, Satsvarup, you should do everything combinedly. If amongst ourselves there is friction, it will be very dangerous." Unquote. Soon thereafter, the GBC was formulated and formed. It did well in the beginning, but then it slipped badly in early 1972. From the perspective of your host speaker, it never fully recovered from that, although the specific crisis referred to in the upcoming quote was overcome, you could say perhaps temporarily overcome by Prabhupada. Here's an excerpt to one of the ringleaders of that ad hoc centralization scheme dated April 11th, 1972, quote, I cannot understand why instead of one GBC man, a person outside the commission was given so much power and there was to be immediate action without divulging the matter to the devotees. And I am surprised that none of the GVC members detected the defects in the procedure. It was detected only when it came to me. What will happen when I am not here? Shall everything be spoiled by GVC?" Unquote. This was the first major crack, and it is a long story. We have covered it threadbare in videos, articles, and in my 2009 book. The point is that Prabhupada was not impressed with the GBC. The myth that he was is certainly nothing more than a self-serving imposition, and is, it is one of the blocks in the Iskan Jenga Tower. The related myth that Prabhupada invested the GBC with an automatic self-correcting mechanism is certainly a false presupposition because he suspended it when the centralization scheme went down. He was never really confident that his movement was in good hands, although he may have once stated something like that as an encouragement. He was never very confident that the GBC would turn the corner and not ruin his movement in due course of time, which is exactly what it did. He was not all that pleased with many of its members. What to speak of his reaction, what it would have been, had he still been here in the spring of 1978, when the commission went off the rails by approving the zonal imposition. Prabhupada was able to foil the centralization scheme in 1972, but here's what he had to say later in that same year to one of its chief ringleaders, quote, Do not centralize anything. Each temple must remain independent and self-sufficient. That was my plan from the very beginning. Why are you thinking otherwise? Once before, you wanted to do something centralizing with your GBC meeting. And if I did not interfere the whole thing would have been killed. Do not think in this way of big corporation, big credits, centralization. These are all nonsense proposals." Unquote. 
Another myth constituting a block in the ISKCON Tower of Power is the idea that the cult's leaders were men of great knowledge. Certainly they were not ordinary men, but Prabhupada indicated that they lacked knowledge. And he gave this warning to one of his leading men about that very fact, dated June 22, 1972, quote, I want you leaders especially to become very much absorbed in the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, and become yourselves completely convinced and free from all doubt. But if there is lack of knowledge, or if there is forgetfulness, everything will be spoiled in time. Unquote. Now, some of you may remember, in last month's presentation, we came down heavy on the myth that Prabhupada wanted the plain clothes pick. No need to go over all of that here. You can go back and listen or read that one, listen to or read it. But that myth does not constitute a major block in the Iskan Jenga Tower. However, also consider this excerpt from a letter to one of his leading secretaries dated October 15, 1976, quote, In all our dealings, we should be above suspicion. They say first impressions are lasting. If someone feels cheated by our men because they are using dubious methods of distribution and collecting money, our purity may be doubted and reputation spoiled, unquote. It was spoiled very quickly by the pick. Dishonesty became rampant by 1978, in no small part because the zonal imposition of the 11 great pretenders, they wanted the pick, but also because all GBC men were shot through with dishonesty. The plainclothes pick initiated in late 1973, helped set the stage for this. It was a major factor as to why so many devotees bought into the zonal scheme and were unable to see it for what it was. They were so absorbed in dishonesty themselves, they couldn't see it. Here's another important excerpt for your edification and realization, dated December 22, 1972, quote, Krishna Consciousness Movement is for training men to be independently thoughtful and competent in all types of departments of knowledge and action, not for making bureaucracy. Once there is bureaucracy, the whole thing will be spoiled, unquote. As most of you know, the current version of the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation is chock full of bureaucracy. And this has been ever increasingly the case for decades. It only began to form a bit while Prabhupada was still here. He was unable to nip it entirely, but he did delay it to a significant extent. The excerpt we just read clearly demonstrates how much he disapproved of it. He wanted all of his sincere and serious disciples to not only become expert and advanced in knowledge and to become fixed in transcendental knowledge, he wanted them to become so in order to become spiritual masters as regular gurus. He then wanted them to become siddha and empowered to spread pure Krishna consciousness to every town and village of the world. He did not want a heavily stratified institution that existed in order to glorify a few megalomaniacs absorbed in self-apotheosis. Instead, he wanted his leading men to train the devotees to become as good as or even better than his leading men were. However, that first echelon did not take the training and did not become self-realized. It instead hijacked the movement culminating in the imposition of the Zonal Acharya era. In due course, in less than a decade, the backlash came in the form of the second transformation, the Collegiate Compromise, 
with its related bureaucracy integral to its reactionary movement, leading to the current deplorable situation. Now, you may object to this. You may claim that the politics in so-called ISKCON is not bad and that the devotees, on the whole, are tolerating one another, getting along and cooperating nicely. Superficially, this is only partly true, but even with that concession, what about Neomat and Ritvik? These two splinter groups spun off from the mother mothership. So-called ISKCON is thus responsible for them, at least directly, because it did not remain bona fide after Prabhupada departed. No one will dispute the fact that there is intense internecine fighting between and amongst the fanatics attached to and representing either so-called ISKCON or Neomat or Ritvik. You can't just come to a right conclusion on the basis of what's going down and happening in the mothership alone. Do any of these excerpts just discussed indicate that things were proceeding well in Prabhupada's branch of the Hare Krishna movement, even while he was physically present. Yet the pretense is to believe that these misconceptions that we exposed just now are essential to how his branch is supposed to operate. However, none of the blocks thus far discussed is the really big one. None so far discussed and exposed is the one which, if removed, collapses with certainty that cult's tower of power. Earlier in our presentation, we promised to discuss the one that does, and now we do just that. It can be summarized by a mere four words. But I was there. Two psychic divisions to this meme, but only one of those will be described in detail and emphasized here. The one we're not going to emphasize will be brief, briefly described now. It constitutes a general or generic ambiance or atmosphere which pervades all of so-called ISKCON, but which is rarely verbalized. It combines itself with posts held Letters received, as Sulochan wrote, count the letters and time of service. It does not, however, constitute a block in and of itself of the Iskan Jenga Tower. Uh, the other one does. It constitutes the most important block because it is applied specifically to one key event in the Hare Krishna movement before Prabhupada left the scene. It is applied to a malinterpretation of that event. Make that a dreadful, self-serving malinterpretation. The but I was there meme is printed on all sides of that Jenga block. It helps to keep it in place. We are making every attempt here to remove it from the cult's tower of power. And this is not the first time we have exposed this particular and flawed presupposition, nor the meme used in order to keep it in place. Understanding it will require some background information, so we'll give that to you now. As most of you know, the key room conversation in the whole movement's history took place in Prabhupada's quarters at the Krishna Balaram Temple on May 28, 1977 in Raman Reti. We have previously discussed that long conversation held between Prabhupada and all of his governing body commissioners. They came to India especially for it. We are not going to go over the whole thing here, but to the degree that you are interested, engage in necessary research in order to know it better. Seek it out and ye shall discover it. The totality of the commission was not privy to all of the conversation, however, that day. This was not known for a long time due to the GBC's well-established penchant for secrecy, but it's becoming known now. The transcript 
and essence of that room conversation was not revealed until 1980, which itself is outrageous. However, that's par for the course for these men who regularly engaged in hiding whatever they thought would benefit them in their schemes by such deception. Before that essential part of the May 1977 room conversation was undertaken, it had been decided that Satsarup and TKG would ask the raw nerve question about how to conduct initiations after Prabhupada left the scene. They botched it badly. However, and this is not well known until now, hardly anyone directly witnessed this. Only six leading secretaries were allowed into a private part of Prabhupada's quarters when that all-important question was asked and answered. Most of you have read that short transcript. Some of you have even studied it. When TKG said, these Ritviks, they're giving Diksha, why did not the other five speak up? They were there, and they were there for a reason. They were not there to remain mum and simply accept. They were there to represent all of the devotees, but they failed to do so. And in that short conversation that we're referring to now, when the whole thing got bollocked up in the middle of it, and Prabhupada said, quote, why consider who, unquote, because everything had become so muddled up and unclear, why did not one of those other men speak up? They were there. They should have seen that the purpose of this difficult but necessary discussion was being blown. Yet despite being there, they all remained silent. Not a peep. Silence means acceptance, but they had no business accepting any of it. It was their duty to demand real clarity. And then, when TKG said what he thought would be the end at the end, when he said, quote, that's, uh, that's clear, unquote, in his obvious attempt to truncate and abort the topic, because in his estimation, he had heard what he could manipulate and wanted to hear, why did not at least one of the other five speak up? None of them did. But Prabhupada wouldn't let it end there. He made a final attempt to summarize what was meant to be gleaned throughout the whole interview. The old guard, those six men in particular, did not come through in what was the ultra-important meeting of the history of the whole movement. Two of them are now dead, and none of the act of uh, none of the others is active in so-called ISKCON. Yet, one of them was recently interviewed for some kind of Prabhupada remembrance video, and in it, he said he knew what Prabhupada wanted in the matter of appointing Diksha Gurus. Oh yeah, he knew. He reiterated the party line that the 11 Ritviks were to become the first initiating spiritual masters. <laughs> Prabhupada appointed Ritviks just over a month after that essential room conversation took place. And during the room conversation, he said that he would create some gurus later, but he never did. He created Ritviks. And all of this was related to that key part of the room conversation, which was severely mishandled by those six men, two in particular. However, this former leader, one of the witnesses, and yes, he was a GBC, being one of the six who heard the raw nerve question, who allowed himself to not be at all involved, but just sat there, now claims that he knew what Prabhupada wanted. He has claimed in the past that he knew the mood of Prabhupada. Oh yeah, he knew the intention of Prabhupada. And on that basis, we're supposed to simply accept. Now he still claims the same thing in relation to the May conversation and the appointment of Ritviks later. And his basis is but I was there. 
Yeah, you were there. But you didn't do your duty, bud. You were asleep at the switch. You didn't do the job. Today, he still backs the party line that the 11 Ritviks were meant to automatically become Diksha Gurus after Prabhupada left the scene. There's no proof of this. And there's no real evidence of it either. His evidence is, but I was there. And how can we be confident that Prabhupada never intended any such thing when he appointed those Ritviks? This is how we can be confident of it. Palena Parachiate, judged by the results. Look what they did. Look at all the havoc they caused. Besides the basic logic that Prabhupada never said that those Ritviks were gurus, despite the fact that he could have directly appointed them as gurus in July of 1977, we are supposed to accept the, air quotes, Iskan party line. We are supposed to accept, because each party man of the old guard backing it now, as they always have, does so on the basis of, but I was there. The colossal hoax, known as the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation, is a pseudo-spiritual scam. In its Jenga Tower of Power, the key block holding the whole thing up is the false presupposition that the 11 Ritviks of 1977 were, were appointed covertly as gurus in July of that year. On that key block, we find the words, but I was there. We are to accept this myth on that basis, but now all of you know better. Reject the myth and reject the old guard narrative. They allowed the movement to degenerate and their narrative simply rationalizes that. Time to let the whole structure topple. Make it happen. Sadeva Samya.